Good evening to everybody. Our first um, viewer uh, is a continuation from, it was a two-part question from last week. You may remember that uh, a man wrote about his wife who was um, feeling worthless, uh, actually more particularly not special because she perceived herself as being average uh, in so many ways. Um, I refer you to the archive of last week uh, for that uh, discussion, but mm, in short, it's not about being special. Uh, in fact, that's just that falls into the whole world's definition that you have to, uh, the world's belief at least, that you have to uh, earn uh, love. And we earn it by being smart, beautiful, clever, talented, um, witty, um, special. Uh, in some way, and then we're deserving of love. Incompatible with the idea of unconditional love. Uh, so he continues. <clears throat> Another issue she's currently dealing with is what she calls her lack of spiritual progress. She's been involved in spiritual practices with me for a little over six months now, but she doesn't feel like she has any more uh, silence in her life now than when she began this. By silence, I assume you mean like peace. She sees me and others around us who are also practicing the same style of spiritual practices, benefiting greatly from what we're doing, and she just doesn't feel like she's getting anything out of it. She beats herself up, thinks that she's no good at anything, um, believes that she can't even meditate right. Um, <laughs> that would be a little discouraging. Uh, I can't do anything right and I can't even sit still and, you know, make my thoughts quiet. Uh, and then this again leads back into the first issue, the feeling of um, being inadequate and like nothing she applies herself to ever comes to fruition. I've tried every approach I can think of, obviously including real love, but nothing seems to be helping. I'll come home from work or from teaching a yoga class. I'm sure she just loves that. You know, she can't manage to do anything spiritual and here you are teaching a yoga class. Um, and lost my place. Um, and I'll find her sitting on the couch crying away because she feels like uh, she has nothing to offer the world. She wants more than anything to feel special, here we are again, and needed, but no matter what I do to show her how special she really is, both to me and to the rest of the world, uh, it's uh, not coming from inside herself, so it doesn't seem to make any difference. It's pretty obvious that this woman has never felt unconditionally loved. Couldn't have, because here she is just beating her brains out, trying to deserve or earn um, affection, attention, peace, comfort, even spiritual comfort. Uh, she just can't imagine it. She can't imagine what it's like to be loved even by a divine source, and how sad is that, uh, without her doing something to earn it. So this is going to be a difficult thing uh, for her to get over. And you know, I'm pretty sure I recommended last time that you actually have her watch the response here, and I would suggest that again. Um, in unconditional love, you don't earn it. You don't have to be special, cool, wonderful. And I completely get where you're coming from, sweetie. Uh, I spent my virtually my entire life believing that I had to be special. In fact, Really, my sense of worth came from being not like everybody else, uh, which, of course, means better than everybody else. Maybe not in every way, but we feel like we have to be better in order to be worth it. And, man, we do that comparison thing constantly. Uh, people, people walk through a checkout line and they're comparing themselves to uh, the person one line over, or they're comparing themselves to the pictures that they see um, on the covers of magazines, for example. We just gotta be better. So I would suggest that you get her a coach um, who can show her what it's like to feel unconditionally loved. You can find those on the website. Um, this isn't gonna be an easy problem. This isn't gonna be something where you can say, well, well you know, just you know, go and read some books. And No, it's, it's harder than that. Um, I work with a man uh, who for well, pretty much his whole life, struggled with this, this feeling. So listen closely. 
uh, because the, his story, you know, really fairly closely approximates yours. Uh, he always felt like he had to be special. He always felt like he was kind of, you know, just average and really not worth anything. And, you know, he's not brilliant. Um, he's not exceptionally articulate. Um, um, not a computer wizard. Um, really ordinary in a whole lot of ways. And I suggested that, as I suggested to you last week, that average is enough when it comes to loving. Uh, we're not going to fall into the special trap at all. Just be average, unconditional loving, and you're going to be heaven to somebody. Almost everybody out there in the world has not known what it feels like to be unconditionally loved. So if you can acquire some for yourself, which means simply accept the love that's being given to you, not earning it, and then can pass on what little bit of love you have, and in the beginning it may be just little bits, little dribs and drabs. In fact, you may be loving at a sub-average level. Actually, it's no maybe to it. In the beginning, you will be sub-average. But if you're willing to persist and keep trying to love, for example, I'm just giving you one way that you could find something that is enormously rewarding. You'll discover that there are people whose lives can be saved by your average loving. Back to this man I was telling you about. Um, I, I recently had a client who uh, was brilliant. Uh, my goodness, uh, he's a genius. Uh, he's a genius at math. He's a genius at lots of things. Uh, would qualify as a genius on mm, any number of scales. And he wanted to know who he could get unconditionally loved by. Now, there's a tendency on the part of really smart people to look down on the people who are not and to think that uh, and it's, you know, not usually conscious, but it's very prevalent. And to think that only somebody who is equally smart could ever understand them or love them. So, uh, intentionally, uh, I sent this brilliant friend uh, to this friend of mine that I was talking to you about, who's, in many respects, average. I got a note from him just the other day, and he said, I'm writing just to tell you how grateful I am that you would hook me up with this guy. Uh, it's I really am feeling closer to him and feeling loved by him. So here's this guy who thought of himself as just sort of average, and it turns out mm, he can be a lifesaver to a guy who's mm, way smarter than he is, makes more money than he does, um, has more education than he does, uh, more abilities in many respects, but he can love him and thereby transform his life. So concentrate on the little things, honey. Don't prove it. Get a coach. Uh, talk to people who are experienced in real love. And just sit back and feel what it's like to be loved for no reason, unconditionally. That will make a big difference in your life. Whereas being special doesn't. I know all the special people. Um, uh, I talked to uh, the other day to an exceptionally beautiful woman, um, special in almost everybody's eyes. Uh, everywhere she goes, she attracts the gaze of both men and women. Certainly would qualify as special, and yet her life's a complete wreck. She she's just she's as empty as a shell, because she's never known what it's like to be loved, except for that. Everywhere she goes, that's what people see in her, and so she's unhappy. So this quest for specialness, mm, it's, it's not just unfruitful, it's destructive, uh, it's distracting. Uh, you continue <coughs> um, about her being special and something to offer the world. And you see, without meaning to, you buy into the lie. If, if we say to somebody who's trying to be special and they say, oh, I'm not special, and then we come back with what is the common thing, we say, oh, but, but you are special. You see what we've done without meaning to? We've told them that, well, no, you are, and see, I have to come up with a way to tell you that you're special because specialness is required uh, to be loved or to matter. Uh, without meaning to, even when we say, oh, no, you are, we actually perpetuate the line, make it worse for them. So when somebody tells me I'm not special, I go, okay, so you're not. So you're just plain vanilla average. So let's, what can we do with vanilla average, as opposed to, 
Oh no, you're special to me, like we do to our kids. <laughs> you continue, it's extremely painful for me to watch her suffer like this. I want more than anything to alleviate this for her, but nothing I've done seems to make a bit of difference. It's well-meaning, but when you say, it pains me to see her like that, she sees your pain as a kind of pity, which again makes her feel smaller, um, as opposed to you're not being pained by it, but instead just loving her and having absolute faith and confidence that in loving her, you can make a big difference in her life. Anytime I feel people come to me every day with the most woeful stories. I mean, holy smokes, you know, I was raped multiple times, I was in war, I killed people. I mean, it would be so easy for me to go, oh, that's just awful. And the instant I do that, I would confirm their victimhood and they would feel worse, not better. People don't need sympathy. They don't need our tears, not to say that sometimes those aren't appropriate. They need our love. They need us. They need our confidence, our faith in them. Uh, and what you're saying here doesn't communicate that. Uh, you said, at this point, I'm doing everything I can to see her fully, to love her unconditionally, to reserve any judgments. Uh, but all I seem to be able to do here is tell her, show her that I love her, and I spend lots of time listening to her and crying with her. doesn't seem to be any alleviation of the suffering. Um, again, if you're crying with her, um, you're not providing uh, an island of calm in the midst of the storm that she feels around her. And much of the storm that she feels, she's generating. Uh, she's just frothing up the waves. And if you come in and, and cry with her, mm, it just makes the waves worse. So relax and try some of the things that we talked about today and last week. Here's a viewer who says, my grandmother and I have not been on the best terms for quite some time. Whenever I see her, our visit might go well, but then it always ends with her trying to dump loads of guilt onto me because I don't contact her as much as she wants. But at this point, I'm not loving enough to want to be around her. I saw her over the weekend, and as my husband and I were leaving, she was doing her guilt thing that she always does, but it's getting worse. She was hugging me, which she loves to do, to have me in her arms and and then let the guilt pour out. I know exactly what you're talking about because I've seen it many times. When she's hugging you, you can't get loose. And while she's appearing to be loving, then while she's got you in her loving embrace, well, then she pounds you and sticks you with knives. It's really kind of ugly, huh? Uh, and probably she doesn't realize she's doing it at all. Then you continue. And then she says, jokingly, of course, that if I don't contact her soon, uh, she's going to disown me. <laughs> she's pretty good at this, isn't she? Uh, something to know, you add, uh, this is a common threat that she's also done to my mom, to my aunt, to my uncle if they don't do what she wants. I mean, holy smokes, baby. This woman really knows how to manipulate the people around you, um, or manipulate the people around her. And you're falling for it. Um, you're obviously in pain about this, and, and I'm not criticizing you, but I am telling you that you're not seeing her. All you're seeing is how she affects you. So, yeah, she's being selfish, but so are you. Um, so, what is she doing? L let's see if we can see her more clearly. Uh, I know how it must feel. Uh, she's clingy, she's angry, she's really, you know, from all outward appearances, pretty ugly, heaps guilt on you. But then you feel it, and you feel uncomfortable because of the guilt that she heaps on, heaps on you. Guilt is a choice. Um, I've had any number of people try to make me feel guilty, but it doesn't work because I just review what the truth is. What is my responsibility here? What is their responsibility for the thing? Um, I may even change my mind after I assess my part in a thing uh, and do more for that person but I'm not motivated by guilt, and so far you are. Even if you're not giving her what she wants because of guilt, out of guilt you're avoiding her. So we sometimes say, um, I can't stand the trap that so-and-so sets for me, and so what do I do? I, I just avoid them. Well, you're still trapped by them because their behavior is still determining what you're doing. 
when you see her truthfully, you'll be able to respond differently. And we'll get to more of that in a second. You continue. I responded in a less than appropriate fashion, I'm sure, uh, by stating, nice threat, Grandma. <laughs> you said, I'm sure I was fairly condescending in my tone, if not a lot. Um, it must be a family trait, honey. Uh, she attacks you, and so how do you respond? You attack her. How did you think that was going to go? No criticism, just seeing it for how it's, how it's going down, so to speak. Uh, you continue, then she actually hit me, square in my back. <laughs> this, this is hysterical. Here's this lady who's probably in her 80s and she's hitting you. My husband was about 10 feet away from us and he heard it. It stung and I felt it for a good three to four minutes afterward. So I don't believe it was all in play as she was trying to pass it off. Now, again, honey, I'm not criticizing you, but look what you're doing. You're doing the same kind of foolishness that Grandma does. You didn't just say, um, she hit me. End of statement. No, you went on to justify it and use guilt by saying, hit me, not just hit me, hit me square in the back. These are all adjectives that we use to make a thing worse. You don't do it consciously, but you do what she does. So she hit me square in my back. My husband was, and you just almost hear the, 10 feet away, and he heard it. So it must have been just horrible. Do you see what you're doing? You're playing up how bad it was. Then you said, it stung. You didn't stop there. It stung, and I felt it for a good three to four minutes afterwards, so I don't believe it was all in play. Darling, you're just loving playing the victim to this woman. Uh, she's a consummate victim, and she's taught mm, one of your parents, whoever it was well, who's then passed it on to you. Um, then you continue. And this, and remember, I'm not criticizing you. I'm trying to help you see what you are doing so that then you become capable of making a wiser choice. It's the only reason to learn these things. It's not to make people feel bad. That's just kind of a waste of time. Uh, you continue, and this is all still going on as we're hugging. I told her that it hurt and it was not okay, and I tried to get out of her embrace, but then she held me even tighter to her. So do you see how this goes? <laughs> she, she attacks you, you attack her, she attacks you more, she cleans all the while. It's insane. So somebody has to break out of this cycle of insanity, and it's not going to be her. You continue, so our relationship has gone from strictly verbal to now where she's now, now, note the way you say this, where she's actually hit me. Uh, you say it as though you'd been victim of a dog attack. Um, you're making a big deal out of this. So don't. Just see it clearly and then make a decision about what you're going to do. But you don't need to play up what she did. Grandma is just being grandma. It'd be like me saying, a pig came in our house and he just oinked and oinked and rooted around it. Yeah, the bottom line of all that is the pig was a pig and couldn't have come in the door if I hadn't opened it. Um, I don't need to go into all the things the pig did just being a pig. Your grandma is just being the victim she's been, probably from the time she was, oh, I'd wager four uh, or so. Most kids have picked up on victimhood by four. Uh, you continue. She's never done this before, and I don't really care to spend any time with her. I know that I'm not loving enough. I get that. I know that I'll end up seeing her again at some point. <clears throat> and I'm tired of her gifts of guilt, and I'm not interested in being whacked by her again. Uh, so what do I do? Especially if she strikes me. I didn't count, honey, the number of times that you either mentioned, embellished, um, or in some way referred to her hitting you. She's an 80-something-year-old lady. Uh, darling, how bad could it be? Uh, the point is, she's just being a victim. And this was just one way that she demonstrated it. So ignore the hit. Uh, it, it's, not, it's just part of the big, bigger overall picture. And do not fall into the trap of punishing her by spending less time with her. Now, that doesn't mean you have to spend more time with her. I'm just saying, don't fall into the trap of making it a punishment because then you're going to be doing exactly what she's doing. She says, well, you haven't been nice to me. You don't visit me. So, so then she hits you. And then you become all offended and go to pull away from her. And then she says, I'm going to take you out of my will. And then you say, I'm not going to spend time with you. You see where this goes? Um, within 
minutes, we've gone from civil to straight into hell. So you make a choice. You realize that your grandmother's a consummate victim and a whiner and a complainer and a manipulator with guilt, but mm, it's just information. So what would you like to do? You decide when the next contact with her will be according to how loving you feel. So you decide, you know, um, I'm feeling unconditionally loving enough today to call grandma and spend three and a half minutes with her. I'm not exaggerating. I'm not being cute. I'm saying that we all have an, a capacity to be unconditionally loving up to a certain point. And for you with grandma, that might be three and a half minutes. It might be 30 seconds. I'm just saying that as you make a choice to be as loving with her as you can be, that will for, for a long time be less than she wants. Irrelevant. But don't just pull away completely and go, well, you are mean to me, I'm not going to... Mm -mm. Love her as much as you can. Choose the time that you're going to talk to her. And then, whether it's in fo uh, on the phone or in person is really irrelevant. At some point, it's going to come time for the conversation to end. Even if you go all the way over to her house, and after, after three minutes you've had enough, you say, well, <clears throat> it's been really nice visiting you, uh, but it's, uh, it's time for me to go. Well, why do you have to leave? You say, oh, I have some important things that I have to do back home. Mm, that's entirely truthful. Uh, it may be uh, resodding the lawn. Uh, it may be polishing your shoes. Uh, doesn't really matter. It's not dishonest. And it's certainly way more important, hence it's not dishonest at all, that you go do anything than to stay there and engage in a battle of guilt, victimhood, and attacking with this woman. That's just nuts. So when you sense that your love's running out, the visit's over. It doesn't matter how much longer she wants you to stay. It doesn't matter whether anybody agrees with your reason. You leave or you hang up the phone. Now you do it politely. Hey, it's been nice to see you. Um, she will guilt you. Uh, I'm not suggesting a way that will eliminate her guilting you. No, I'm suggesting a way that will preserve your ability to be loving. So when she guilts you, then what do you do? A lot of different ways you could say this. I'm going to suggest to you just one. Um, modify it in any way you want. I, it's not a proprietary quote. So you say to her something like, Grandma, um, I've really enjoyed the time I've spent with you here uh, tonight or in the mid middle of the day on the phone, whenever it is. And I spend time with you because I want to because I care about you. Um, so th think of it like, think of it as a gift. Now, if I were to, and you're saying all this to her, if I were to, if you were to send me a present that you had wrapped and spent a lot of time and effort to buy for me, what would you think if I were to call you back and say, no, no, I wanted it wrapped differently, uh, and I wanted a different thing, uh, and I wanted two of them instead of one, how would you regard that? Well, it would be unspeakably thoughtless. It would be ungrateful. It would be rude. And what I'm offering you when I give you my time is a gift, a wrapped gift. So now you have a choice. Um, you can criticize it. Um, you can demean it. You can tell me that I should have given you more. Um, or you can choose to be happy with the gift. So that's your choice. This is the gift that I've chosen to give you, and that's the time that I've spent with you. You can now like it and be happy, or you can be miserable and tell me how it should have been more, but if you choose the latter course, you won't be as happy, and if you keep doing it, I probably won't feel like giving gifts as often. So choose, Grandma, which would you prefer? Actually ask her and wait for an answer. Uh, people are not used to being talked to in this way. Uh, but I have said this to people, and it's amazing how disarmed they can feel by it. Because you're not accusing her. You're not telling her she's doing anything wrong. You're saying, here's the choice you have. What choice would you like to make? And then she gets to make her own choice. And if she keeps guilting you, if you keep listening to a guilt tirade, you're, you're the problem. You say, oh, well, hey, like I said, it's been nice to talk to you. Uh, I'll call you again. Uh, goodbye and you hang up, or you leave. 
that you were saying that she she holds on to you tighter. Well, darling, um, if you can't manage to physically break the embrace of your 85 year old grandmother, um, work out more. Uh, you you can end the any interaction anytime you wish to, and not feel the least bit guilt guilted. It's really quite fun. Next viewer says. I've really worked hard at my teaching job, but I've never felt confident in myself. When I taught history, I was always teaching uh, periods that I had not studied uh, in depth uh, in uh, college. And then when I started to teach religion and philosophy again, I've had to learn all that on the job. So I'm, I'm always feeling like I'm behind. I've gotten two master's degrees and I'm finishing work on a third, but I just don't, I still don't feel that great about myself. The amount of hours I've spent studying over the years has meant a big cost to my personal life in the sense of hours spent at the desk studying and preparing classes. I realize now through real love that uh, I've also used my work as a retreat. Ever since I was at boarding school, there was always work to be done. If I felt lonely or upset, I could uh, submerge myself in my studies and I would feel better. Um, we've been taught that if we just work to earn more, of whatever, uh, if we have more of whatever, then we'll feel better. So if only we were more beautiful, uh, intelligent, successful, rich, powerful, whatever, then we'll be happier. And it turns out that this is just so difficult for us to get because the whole world runs this way. It's difficult for us to accept that the entire world is wrong. I've been asked that on many occasions. People have said to me, well, wait a minute. If what you're saying in real love is true, then the whole world is wrong. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, isn't that kind of presumptuous of you? Not really. Take a look at the world. How happy are they? Huh. They're miserable. So clearly they haven't gotten it figured out. And you don't have to fall into this trap. Um, you, uh, you know, I got a great deal of education. Um, wow, I was just educated out the years, you know, and did really well at it and was praised for it. And because I was praised for it as a kid, then I figured mm, I would do more. Um, studying and education are very seductive because people praise it. Uh, so I learned to do it in school, even learned to do it in church. You know, if you know the scriptures better, then you're a better person. And it's all nothing. Uh, all of that doesn't make us happy. And that contradicts the entire way the rest of the world lives. So that's a hard principle to get in the beginning. You continue. The thing is that now, years later, I seem to be working as hard as I was 10 or 15 years ago. There's always more to learn. And I never seem to feel that I've mastered things. I feel like a jack of all trades, master of none. I keep thinking you're sounding a lot like the woman who doesn't feel special enough. I keep thinking if I work a little harder, if I give it one more year, maybe I'll feel on top of it, I'll feel good about myself. I finally feel, uh, then I'll finally feel that I've made it, that I'm okay. The thing is, I'm wondering if this is really true. And what I've been saying up to this point is, no, it's not. Uh, as you say, you were very successful in your career, you got to the top, and yet somehow that didn't do it for you. And as I learn more about real love, I'm beginning to think that I'd like time to cultivate more friends in my life rather than just have my books and yet the lifestyle I've created for myself doesn't allow this. Oh, honey, there's no such thing as your lifestyle doesn't allow you to nothing. We choose our lifestyle. We get to choose every single thing we do in our lives. Everything. And how we feel about it. So it's a choice, baby. Uh, in academics, you never will be done. Uh, there will always be more to learn. There will always be somebody who's smarter than you, more articulate, uh, more something. So why even start down that road? You continue, I'm wondering what to do. Part of me feels that if I quit my job, uh, I'll have given up and never made it. But then the other part wonders whether even if I carry on working like stink uh, and get to a point where I do know my stuff and have all the resources sorted and I can deliver all those amazing classes, that will finally do it for me. I would suggest that you familiarize yourself with a couple of concepts. First, uh, is one that we already talked about. Success will never, ever make you happy. It won't. It, in fact, they're really unrelated. Um, you know, it's been proven that uh, people become happier <coughs> with the success and money that they get up to a certain point, which is about a little beyond 
uh, the poverty line, um, not even rich. And once they keep money, keep making money past that what we'll call basic subsistence level, in other words, it does tend to contribute to unhappiness if you're starving to death. Uh, that's a problem, kind of distracting. But if you get to the place where you, you know, got a safe place to live and, and uh, enough to eat and, you know, clothing on your back, and then that's enough. And getting more past that contributes zero to your happiness. They've done studies of, you know, exceptionally wealthy people. They're not a bit happier than people who are just, you know, kind of lower middle class. Second concept. Success won't make you happy, but loving will. And it works every time. So, prioritize. Uh, and prioritize loving first. And then learn all that you can about that. But this isn't like academics where you just learn stuff about real love. You know, learn the phrases, read the books, memorize the concepts. It's about how you feel. So it's about spending time around people who can love you and people that you can practice loving. Third concept. It occurs to me that I'd said I'd give you a couple, so, well, this is a bonus then, isn't it? Uh, and that's allow yourself... Uh, to perform according to a standard of good enough. We've also been taught this lie. If you're going to do anything, do it well. If you're going to do anything, be the best. Says who? Who said that? What is their pedigree of happiness and loving that we should be believing that lie? Um, there are a whole lot of things in my life that, you know, frankly, just being good enough is just plenty. I'm just kind of good enough uh, on computers. I don't intend to spend any more time learning to be more proficient at computers because good enough is all right. Um, I got to a place where I, I played the piano. I uh, played the piano pretty well. Uh, you know, I've played before thousands of people and heard them cheer and played concertos. And, um, and then I realized that, you know, if I was going to be the best, it would take an absolute consumption of all my time. So I decided that I'd be good enough. I haven't regretted that decision one time. There are a whole lot of things like that that I've decided that mm, good enough is okay because the price for being better is too high. Now, hear this. You talked about giving those great lectures, yeah? In my long education career, I've had a great number of teachers. And I remember almost none of them. I don't remember one teacher because they were brilliant. I can remember a couple of teachers. Out of all those teachers, I can remember a couple that made a difference to me. And do you know why? Because they cared about me. I'm not kidding. I mean, there aren't a whole lot of people who've had more time in education than I have. Uh, and yet, I don't remember the brilliant teachers. I don't care. I remember the ones that cared about me and tailored a lesson in a way that it would matter to me, that it would teach me something I could use. Man, that I'll remember those people forever. Uh, I would suggest that you read the, the book that you can get on the website called uh, Under the Bridge. There's a story in there about a teacher who made uh, an unfathomable difference in the life of a young man. And he didn't make the difference because he was smart or because he'd learned all the references. Oh, he, he learned them well enough, um, but, you know, he wasn't set apart as a genius in his field. What mattered was how much he cared about his students. And because he did, they were riveted by what he taught. He had their attention completely in his hands because he cared about them. So I would just suggest you prioritize what matters most and then the rest, mm, you know, you may get to it, you may not. <clears throat> Here's uh, a viewer who says, I have a question about how to cope with toxic environments. Uh, in working with uh, local wise men and women, how fun that is to hear that you've got local wise men and women. That's something many people don't know. So lucky you. I've identified that there are some toxic people and environments that I've been involved with. So have we all. 
I have since learned that it's probably in my best interest to leave these environments in order to work on my own fullness. However, I'm finding that there are a couple of situations that are more difficult to leave than others, such as um, dealing with an ex-spouse, uh, where there's shared parenting with children under 18, or co-workers, when I don't have a new job or position that I can go to yet. What advice can you give um, concerning coping in these situations when you must be involved, but you don't want to feel drained every day? We talked about priorities just a minute ago. Um, and I would re-emphasize that word. I don't know why it's come up twice in one video chat, but there you are. We tend to work backward. What we do is we decide what we want, um, and then we look at the consequences of making those decisions. And if the consequences are difficult, we go, Ooh, well, I better not do that. Hmm. Um, if that's how everybody did, then we would have no new inventions on the planet, no new ideas, nothing. Because the consequences of doing something differently from how everybody else does it are usually unpleasant. Um, people don't like it when you behave in a different way. Uh, even if it doesn't directly affect them. Because if you behave in a different way, now they, either ha they have to either think, hmm, it, um, do I have to change my thinking? Or can I just discount the messenger, in this case, you? So they tend to criticize people who do things, who are pioneers. How do you tell the pioneer in a group? He's the one with all the arrows in his back. Mm, people like it when everybody around them is pretty much the same. And you're doing that here. You're counting the costs ahead of time and then going, wow, maybe I shouldn't do that. Wrong. The only way to be truly happy in our lives is to uh, decide what is most important, what will make us happiest, and then, I mean really happy, not entertained, and then simply doing that. The consequences then just follow. Um, I make a decision, for example, to be loving to you. And if that means that for a while you're going to spit in my face and be nasty and rude and not appreciate at all what I'm doing, well, then that's just the price of doing the right thing. But first, I made the decision to do the right thing. So, in your case, if you're relatively new in experiencing and sharing real love, then you don't want to throw yourself into situations where you know that you're going to be drained. If you're just learning to hit a baseball, um, you don't want to um, try to be in the World Series uh, because the next pitcher is going to make you feel so bad about yourself <laughs> that you'll never play again. No, we gradually increase the difficulty of our environments so that we can grow from them. But if you take on too much too soon, you'll be crushed. So let's look at some of these environments that you're talking about. Uh, an ex-spouse, for example. If you've got an ex-spouse who's being difficult with you and critical and like many ex-spouses are, then for a time until you become more capable of loving, then you don't spend any time talking to them at all. I get calls like this all the time. Um, I, I, I argued yesterday with my um, ex-husband for an hour and before they even finish, I stop them and go, well, then you're insane. What do you mean, they say. Well, if it's your ex-husband, why are you arguing for any longer than 20 seconds? I could see mm, some unavoidable situations where for 20 seconds you'd be in conflict, but anything past then, you're the moron. So with your ex-spouse, if, if it's a difficult relationship, I'm not saying that it's not possible to. Some ex-spouses get along just fine and, you know, bless their hearts. But if you're being drained by it, because that's the situation you brought up, then you have no contact at all. And, and people say, well, but, but we share the raising of a child. No, you really don't. You think you do, and that's a myth. When the child's in your house, then you raise the child any way you want to. When the child's in his house, it's none of your business what he does. And yet, ex-spouses will sit and argue for hours about, well, I think you should do this, and I think you should do that. And we need to have consistency, that we need to have the same rules. And really, 
you think with a spouse who's abusive and ugly and unloving toward you, which is probably the reason you got divorced, you think that now, when you're talking about the child, he's suddenly going to become accommodating, understanding, kind, loving. Are, are you crazy? So, no, uh, you don't talk at all. Well, but we have to. No, you don't. You have your house, you do it your way. He has his house, he does it his way. And if he decides to be a stupid parent while your child is in his house, well, he gets to be a stupid parent. And it's none of your business because you're not married anymore. Well, but we have to get together when, you know, we trade the child off. Even then you don't. Pick a neutral a neutral place. McDonald's is my favorite recommendation. Or, I'm not an advocate for McDonald's. Burger King would be fine. Um, where they have those outdoor playgrounds or indoor playgrounds. Um, and you drop your child off at the door and you say, go in there and play on the slide. You tell your ex-spouse the kid's going to be playing on the slide. And you keep your eyes on the kid uh, from the car or you can stand right outside the window. That's fine. Uh, so that you feel safe about the kid until the ex-spouse shows up at the other door, walks in, takes the kid. Hmm, I'll be darned. No words are exchanged. Nothing. If you have to arrange a, a doctor's appointment or whatever, use email. Let's say that your ex-spouse calls you and says, well, look, there's been a change. Um, you know, I, I have to leave the kid with you this weekend because I'm going off with my three 12-year-old girlfriends to Reno. Uh, whatever. All right, so that's, that's a call you have to take. But the instant that he says, now, I want to talk to you about, you go, no, no, you don't have to talk to me about that. Is this about our son? If it's about our son and the timing of where he'll be, I'm glad to hear it. But if it's about anything else, um, we already tried having those discussions, which led to a divorce, and so I have really no interest in continuing them now. People who have arguments with their ex-spouses are like some sort of nutty that they won't have to meet. Why not just stick your head in the toilet? Um, and the consequences might be difficult. I mean, th this is why we, we, we get afraid. We say, well, but then he won't like me. Well, I'll be darned. When you got divorced, didn't he already prove he doesn't like you? So we have nothing to lose there. Um, let's say that the difficult person or the draining environment or toxic environment, what if it's a parent? Well, I can't just disown my parents. Yeah, actually you can, uh, at least temporarily. So I've actually written out prescriptions uh, because people have no guts uh, in talking to their parents about difficult things. I've actually written out on paper and said, um, Susie uh, has been uh, told that she needs to refrain from any environment that's not completely nurturing. Any environment that could bring up present or past conflicts. So for the next 60 days, she won't be having contact with any of her family members just because it's confusing to her. As she becomes healthier and happier, she will reinitiate contact with her family. And I've written that out for people, and they've given it to their family because they didn't have the guts to do it themselves. That's fine. Um, never, the bottom line is never go into an interaction where you know ahead of time you don't have sufficient love to deal with it. And if, for example, people will call me and they'll say, every time I get on the phone with my, pick one, mother, father, um, it just drains me instantly. Well, then why do you get on the phone with them? Well, because they call me. You don't have caller ID on your phone? Really, you don't. Y you tell them for the next 30 days. What You pick a number. Um, there are some things that I need to learn, and I need to not be distracted by past relationships. And then when the parent goes, oh, well, how could you treat me in this way? I brought you, brought you into the world. You, you just repeat yourself. You say, so I'll talk to you in 30 days. You don't answer their objections. You don't answer their pleas. They're crying. They're clinging. You avoid toxic relationships. Now, you brought up work. Obviously, you can't avoid the people at work. But what we do is, uh, here you are sitting in your cubicle, and along comes a person who is demanding, critical, demeaning, unkind, and then... We think that we have to put up with it. No, you really don't. And so, um, and so what you do is you keep your conversations to strictly work. And when they sit there and they start to shoot the breeze, you do as I was talking about on a video chat two or three weeks ago. Uh, you say, hey, 
nice talking to you, but right now I have to get back to, to what I'm doing. I've got to get this done by blank. And when I say it's been nice talking to you, I mean you can say that after three seconds if you're busy or if that person is particularly toxic. Notice what I'm telling you is you have complete control over your environment. You do. Uh, we feel so helpless and we hate feeling helpless. But it turns out that you really have a say. Um, you know, if, uh, and we're not going to go into all the ramifications of this, but I've had any number of people write me and say, well, here's an exception where I really don't have control. And it turns out, yeah, they do too. Now, I admit there are a few rare exceptions. Uh, so you're thrown into the state prison, um, into solitary, and there's only one guard interacting with you and he sprays you with a hose. All right, that may be involuntary, but my goodness, you have to search that far and wide to find a circumstance that is. We really have a choice about the environments we're exposed to. And while we're just learning real love, we need to be exposed to essentially none. Here's a, a viewer who says, my seven-year-old provides many opportunities for me to love him. <laughs> That's a very sweet way of saying that. In other words, he can be a real pill. Um, however, I often fall short. Yeah, who, who doesn't? When he is a good boy, my life seems easy and happy. Uh, more often than not, uh, I have a very empty child. Uh, now, tonight I told him that I would like to go on a special family trip this weekend and visit some special friends. But if you find it challenging to get along with your three-year-old brother, then perhaps we need to stay home and work on how to be loving. I guess it's not quite clear to me. I guess the special trip you're taking him. <coughs> um, so all of a sudden, I have a child I didn't even recognize. Uh, seriously, nothing has motivated him like this before. He was kind, loving, gentle, caring, and everything, uh, caring and everything and more to his brother. Unbelievable. Now, here I sit afraid to love him or show him any more love. But honestly, I'm thrilled. I mean, thrilled and I don't want to stop. But here's the deal. He's treating his, oh, he is treating his brother this way because he probably feels he isn't going to get something great. Do I have a conversation with him? Do I reinforce? The story isn't entirely clear to me. And so uh, I'm going to have to work with what I've got. Um, it was a threat. But maybe we should stay at home. So, so what I'm getting out of this is that essentially you were threatening him. Um, you, you were all going to go on a trip, but you were saying that if you can't get along with your three-year-old brother, then you can't go. Um, actually, that's fine to do. No kidding. Uh, as long as there's zero irritation and no implication of a threat. It's like this. H here would be a way, one way that you could say it. But the tone and the delivery are everything. So I would say to this kid, um, Billy, uh, we'll call him, symbolizing probably Billy the kid. So I'd say, Billy, this weekend we're going um, to visit uh, Six Flags, whatever it is. And I'd love to take you. But you know, I'm just not up for any fighting uh, on this particular weekend. We're going to make it pleasant and fun and stress-free for me. Every once in a while, Mom needs stress-free moments, and this is one of them. So I really can only take along kids that uh, are willing to make this uh, easier for me. Uh, I admit it. Uh, so if you're going to be fighting with your brother between now and then, then what you're going to be indicating to me is that mm, you don't really want to have a stress-free, fun weekend. You'd rather fight. Uh, and if that's what you'd rather do, then uh, I'll find a babysitter and we'll leave you home. And you can fight to your little heart's content. You can fight till you bleed. You're welcome to do that. But I can't take in the car with me on a trip and, and on a weekend uh, somebody who's going to you know, be this unpleasant. I love you. Uh, you can behave in any way that you want to here at home, and we'll deal with it moment by moment. Uh, but on a trip like that, um, I need this to be easier for me. So you choose. Now, at that moment, you said he became a different child. He became pleasant. 
obviously um, he's being pleasant so that he can get what he wants, which is to go on the trip. I, I, I get that. Um, so don't be too thrilled uh, at this point because, you know, right now he's just kind of purchasing your um, approval. But you emphasize to him, you tell him ahead of time, you say, this has to continue. I'm not telling you how you have to behave. I'm telling you what the price is. So if you want to be difficult and fight with your brother, you just go right ahead. But there's a price for everything. Um, I speed, the cops give me a ticket. Uh, you want to behave badly, you can, but you can't go on this particular trip. It's important that you not convey to the child the feeling that when you're bad, I don't want to be around you. See the difference? That's why you got to be really careful what it's, it's the idea you're communicating. It doesn't matter if you stumble on the words. So that's why you emphasize, Billy, I love you. I like being around you even when you fight with your brother. I love you no matter what you do. This weekend is a special event. Uh, and it's okay to have special events on a regular basis. Um, you know, we would sometimes in our family say, hey, we're going to all go out to the movies, but we can really only have at the movies people who are deciding to behave like civilized human beings because we all don't want to be thrown out of the movie theater. So if you want to behave badly uh, in the day prior to the movie, you're welcome to, but what you're declaring is, mm, I'm not going to be a civilized human being and so um, we'll just choose to leave you home. Uh, same thing with him. And then you want to explain to him ahead of time that if he decides after you've left for the weekend, because this would be tempting, after you've already left to go to wherever it is on this special weekend, his tendency would be to think, well, now I'm going. So why would I need to keep up the civil behavior? So you explain to him that if he wants to do that, you will make arrangements wherever you go so that he still stays home. So for example, let's say you go to Six Flags uh, four hours away or a million miles away. Uh, you say, I'm sure I can find a babysitter in whatever city we go in, and you'll stay home while we go and do whatever it is. So this isn't something where you alter your behavior to get what you want, and then you go back to doing whatever you feel like doing. Kids need to understand that there's simply a consequence, a price to be paid for when they behave a certain way. Um, and give them examples, like the getting a ticket, like uh, if you go into a movie theater. Um, while you're in the middle of the movie, you are welcome at any time to say anything you want to anybody. You can make noise, uh, throw things on the floor, but they'll throw you out of the theater. So you can behave as you wish, but there's a price to be paid. Um, you can stand up in the middle of a movie theater and scream fire, for example, but then they take you to jail. Uh, so there's a price for whatever behavior we choose, and that is what you're communicating to him. Then it doesn't come across like a threat or that you're angry. So here's um, a viewer who says, I have a real love friend who recently asked me if I had underlying anger toward her. I don't. Uh, I really love and care about her. I feel a little nervous now uh, interacting with her more cautiously. And that has raised uh, a little discomfort. Perhaps now I feel slightly perturbed because I think she was telling me that she couldn't feel loved or love me with me just being me. Uh, or do I have it wrong? Oh, you might have it right. Uh, it might be, for example, that th this person is just such a, uh, a victim that there's almost nothing you can say without her going, oh, oh, do we, do we have issues? I have lots of people that I talk to who do that to me. Um, I'll call them and they'll say, well, you know, I, I haven't called you in a while because I felt like the last time we talked, you were irritated at me. And see, what they then want is all these reassurances. Oh, no, I didn't mean, I just go, mm, no. And then it's up to them whether they want to stay feeling irritated, whether they want to keep feeling like victims. Uh, it's up to them. I would suggest to you that you not fall into that dance that they're inviting you to. Just because somebody invites you to dance on the field of death doesn't mean you have to accept. So when they say, I feel like uh, you were mad, you say, no, not, not as far as I know. But then don't you change the way you interact with that person. 
Don't treat them differently. Don't be offended that they took your love and turned it into an offense. No, people get to do that. Uh, there are people who misunderstand my love lots of times. On the other hand, there are people who also forgive me when I'm being an idiot. So, mm, it washes out. Um, but don't vary your behavior. Keep loving this person. Now, I've had a few people in my life, not many, uh, who, no matter what I've done, they've chosen to feel victimized by it. Well, well but, but do, do, you, do you really care about me? Um, well, didn't you really mean to hurt me when you said this? Where, after a period of, I mean, years, I finally understood that this person was never going to be feel loved, feel loved no matter what I did. They were always going to take it like a victim. They were always going to be hurt. You know, after long enough, um, I'm pretty patient, but after long enough, eventually I give up. Uh, it's not that I give up caring about them, but I give up sharing with them time, which is precious, because I could continue to devote my time to loving somebody who will never receive it, has shown no evidence of receiving it, or I could give that same time and love and attention to somebody whose life would be benefited. Mm, that's not difficult math uh, for me. Although it takes me a while to get to that place. Eventually, mm, I sometimes do choose not to associate with people. But certainly not after once or twice of somebody saying, well, I, I think you're mad at me. Oh, that, that's just the human condition that people need reassurance that you still care about. That's what that really comes down to. When somebody says, I feel like you're mad at me, what they're really saying is, do you still love me? That's really what they're saying. And when you get that, then you realize, well, well I'll just keep loving you some more and we'll see how that works out. From a seven-year-old, what are you doing up this late? I want to know. Uh, what if I am being really bad and wouldn't do what I'm supposed to do even though mom is being loving, what should my mom do when I still talk back? Oh, all right, well, so you, your mom would then just describe to you the consequences of your continuing to be what you call bad. It's not that you're being bad. Um, nobody's bad. It's just that sometimes when you get empty enough, when you get afraid enough, uh, especially afraid that people don't care about you, you behave really badly to get attention. Or sometimes you're just being stinking lazy. Uh, you don't want to do what you're supposed to do because you'd rather watch television, for example. So in those cases, rather than your mother getting angry at you, what she would say to you is, if you want to keep doing this, you may, but there's a price. Uh, I just got a call from a mother uh, today, in fact. And her six-year-old, interestingly, almost... Uh, I know you're much older, but close. Um, her six-year-old, she told the six-year-old that if you want to have a bedtime story uh, read to you, then you need to have your teeth brushed and you need to be all ready for bed by 8 o'clock. And in order to help the child, just like your mother might help you, she, would, she said, you know, you've only got about 15 minutes left. Uh, and the, the boy said, well, well, I don't want to. And so the boy refused to brush his teeth. Okay, no problem. But then when it came time to bedtime, he said, I want you to read me a story. And she said, no. No, there's only time to read you a story uh, if you've gotten all ready for bed by 8 o'clock. So what she taught him was the price of his choosing to be what you call bad, which is really just being, you know, stinky and resistant or lazy or whatever. Um, the, the price for that was that he wouldn't be able to have time with her. And she said, I would like to read to you. I would like to spend time with you. I'll always love you. But I only have so much time in an evening. And now I can't spend it with you because you weren't ready for bed. And then if he continues to not uh, prepare for bed, then she starts to eliminate things like television time and computer time and so on. So that's what I would suggest to your mother. You be sure to relay that on to her, will you? So thanks for the, uh, the great questions. Like as usual. We'll uh, be back in a week. 
I look forward to uh, talking to you all then. In the meantime, if you have questions, please send them in uh, to uh, greg at reallove.com. And between now and uh, next Tuesday, just remember that it's always about real love. See you next week.